Okay, I'm glad you all came because it's hard to talk to an empty room. It's good to see you here, and because this is a nice size class. I don't mean it's a class, actually. It's a nice group. But I used to teach a class about this size as a graduate, graduate studies class. And they're easy to work with because everybody can take part. And that's what I like to do when I talk, and when I lecture. And I'm not lecturing today, I'm talking today. And I, I would like you to, if you have a question as I go along, please ask me. So hold your hand up so I know it's you that wants to how you have something to say and I'll and we'll, we'll go with that. I find that these things move more easily and people learn more and ha have more enjoyment if they actually get to take part and get their questions answered at the time instead of having to wait to the end of the class and then, you know, it kind of falls apart. So anyway, if you have a question, have no qualms about saying, hey, 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 me, I want to talk, okay? Okay, now I have this, this map on the wall here for a reason that, that this is where I start. If I don't have this to start from, I can't talk, okay? What reason this is here is to, I want to illustrate to you what the nature of the British blockade was. A, a lot of people know it was a blockade, but they don't understand how it was a blockade. And the British blockade in World War I was, was absolutely airtight. The only thing that got through the blockade was U-boats. But nothing else got through that blockade. Now, someone's going to say, well, wait a minute, I know what they did early in the war. Yes, you're right. Early in the war, in the first three or four months of the war, they ran some supply ships out of the, uh, out of the, up this north about area up here. They got, yes, they did that. But once, these lines represent the 10th Cruiser Squadron patrol lines. Now, once, once the 10th Cruiser Squadron was fully deployed and, and reinforced, expanded, they closed that door permanently. They, they, that door was slammed shut tight. Down here, see this thing is not working the way I want it to do. See, you know my magic? Boom, it's gone. Okay, down here in the Dover Straits, they sealed off the English Channel and that was a piece of cake because it's not very wide. And, and so they were able to, to you know, without a, they have a lot of ships down there, but they netted it against U-boats which really didn't work. But as far as surface traffic was concerned, the English Channel was, was a, like a closet door. They just closed it, locked it. The only thing that got through going in was what they wanted going in. And the only thing that came out was what they didn't want coming out, which were U-boats. Anyway, the problem with the, with the blockade that the Germans has, had were, were, was two, two, two points, or two fold. The first was that with the blockade in effect and them unable to receive anything, supplies of any kind, it meant they couldn't get the war materials that they had to have for their industry, particularly Krupp. Germany imported, I'll give you an idea of what they were up against, Germany imported all of its heavy industrial raw materials. The only thing they had in abundance sufficient to handle German industrial needs was coal. Beyond that, they didn't have anything. They had to get it. They got ore out of Sweden. They got most of their stuff from us, uh, they got uh, some other, uh, uh, they got, uh, come on, help me here, um, nickel. They got nickel out of Canada. Uh, that was before the war. But when the war started, that all closed down. They didn't have it anymore. As far as their food supplies were concerned, they, Germany did and does import 33% of its food supplies. Its agriculture, even at its peak operation or production, can't supply Germany with enough food to feed the population. So they import 33% of their food supplies. And, they, and in those days, all of that stuff came across the North Sea, and it, it, some of it went through the English Channel, but most of it went north around, north around, down through the North Sea, and down here to the, where the three big German commercial ports are, Bremen, Bremerhaven, and Hamburg. The, When the, when the British launched the, the, the blockade on the 4th of August, 1914, overnight, Germany lost the use of 74% of her commercial fleet. They were tied up in either uh, neutral ports as, as interned, or they'd been seized by the British. What was left, what was left, could only carry on trade, coastal trade, along here, and they could carry trade across the Baltic. 
but the Baltic trade could only supply Germany with 25% of whatever it needed. So you see, the, you look at the numbers, and on the day of the war, from the time the war started in Germany, they were in trouble. And here's another thing. When the war, before the war started, the Germans made no preparations for having any food reserves at all. On the day the war started, they had zero food reserves. They had only enough industrial material to supply Krupp for six months. By November, by November 1914, the German artillery in the field had absolutely no remaining reserve munition supplies. And they had a four-day supply on the Western Front. And the only way they could resupply was by immediate production. So it all had to come right from the factory, right to the front. That's why early in the war there was not a lot of, of uh, artillery for the Germans. They had very little artillery. So now, having gone through that part, the dull part, the Germans had, had two problems facing them. One was that the British and the French were receiving all the supplies they needed from the United States. They got raw materials, they got munitions, they got uh, airplanes, they got guns, they got everything they needed from us. And, it was, and the supply line from the United States to England was one that the Germans couldn't interdict. Not at that time, not early in the war especially. In the first place, they didn't have enough U-boats. In the second place, the U-boats they had didn't have the horsepower, the range to go out there and actually attack these um, uh, lone freighters and tankers and things that were coming across the country effectively. They couldn't effectively interrupt the, interrupt the supplies, uh, flow of supplies. And on the other hand, the Germans couldn't partake of this bounty of supplies that was available to the United States. So their problems were, how are we going to interrupt that flow of supplies to the Allies, and how are we going to get our own source of supplies running again so that we can go ahead and carry on the war? There were two intelligence units that were given the task of solving those twin problems or related problems. One was a German Army intelligence unit known as the Geheimdienst. Geheimdienst had two subsections, Abteilung 3B and the one called Section Politik, which means political section. Section Politik was charged exclusively with, the, with sabotage in foreign countries and, and more directly sabotage in the United States. Well, I'm going to give you this in two halves because the story is in two halves. They're parallel and they're related and they're caused by the same problem, but they're not connected you know, in, in a sense of in a cooperative sense. They didn't work together. Okay. So the first half, the one that was launched in March 1915 was a sabotage operation. They sent an officer to New York. His name was Franz von Rentland. He was a naval officer, Kapitan Leutnant, which in those days was a full a lieutenant in the US, similar to a lieutenant in the U.S. Navy. And uh, he was given uh, about uh, five million million dollars in credits in New York banks. He had about a half a million dollars in cash with him. His job was to spread that money around and organize three sabotage cells. One in New York, one in Baltimore, and one in New Orleans. He, his contact man in Baltimore was, was Paul G.L. Hilkin, an American citizen, excuse me, <clears throat> an American citizen who had been born in Baltimore, raised in Baltimore. His father was a German immigrant. He and his dad owned A. Schumacher and Company, which was a tobacco import company. Paul was also the um, American representative in Baltimore for North Deutsche Lloyd, which is North German Lloyd does, in NDL to them. Uh, he, was, he was representative for them, and he was also the uh, Swedish vice consul in Baltimore. And the, and the reason that he was Swedish vice consul is because Sweden was very sympathetic to Germany, so was Paul. And the, being the Swedish vice, vice consul in Baltimore gave Paul the opportunity to use the diplomatic mail to transmit and send information back to Germany that he wanted him to know about. Paul had been a member of the Navy's intelligence unit, which is uh, the big Navy unit is called the Nachrichtendienst, Marina Nachrichtendienst. But the, the unit he was involved in was called the Etappendienst. Now, Etappen in German means supply. And the Etappendienst charge at the time was to, was to resupply, provide resupply, for all German surface raiders operating away from areas 
you know, like in the Caribbean, the uh, east coast of South America, um, wherever they were, out, wherever they were, uh, they were to resupply them with coal, food, spare parts, water, anything they needed um, to operate their ships at sea. The Etapadines did this through uh, cells known as Etapa, and they had Etapa cells in all over, all over the world, in every major port, New York, in our country, New York, Boston, uh, Philadelphia, Baltimore, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, the New Orleans, in our, my, my city, San Francisco, they were very active too. Um, and, and, but they, I wanna make this clear to you, the Atapendeast and its cells did not get involved in espionage, nor did they get involved in sabotage. Okay, they were strictly a clandestine supply operation. Admittedly, the way they were supplying these ships at sea would attract the attention of the federal authorities in this country, which it did, and, and so they had to be very careful that they weren't exposed and they, they could work quite. The top and D cell members were almost all American citizens. All of them were involved in the shipping industry in some way so that they would be useful in being able to put uh, goods ashore into ship boats or ships that could go to sea and resupply these German ships. So on one hand, you've got the Navy, the Atapendienst, operating this clandestine supply route and, and, and operation out of the United States. And on the other hand, you've got uh, uh, Section Politique, who is now has uh, sent their first, first uh, saboteur or organizer to the United States. The two, the two prongs, if you want to look at it, the, that began operations, the sabotage in March 1915 and the, the, um, the submarine side of the thing, the supply side of the thing, uh, began actually in America in uh, February 1915. The, um, so here we go. When von Rentlin came to the United States, he organized these three cells, you know, New York, Baltimore, and New Orleans. And they all went to work. And he had a fellow in New York, named Dr. Sheely, who was a German citizen. And Dr. Sheely ran a dummy corporation out of, New, out of New Jersey that was called the American Agricultural Company. And, and he was able to acquire, because he was in the agricultural and chemical fertilizer business, he could get all the chemicals that he needed. And his job was to make the bombs that that, that these three sabotage cells were gonna plant in ships and factories and silos and trains, trains anywhere they could to blow up munitions before they were delivered to the, to the Allies. They, the original bomb that they made was a, to keep it started out as a lead sheet, thin lead sheet, and it was, they, they interned sailors in the ships in New York Harbor put these, made the casings out of this lead for these bombs. They didn't, usually guys worked in the engine room, they wouldn't be bothered. And they would roll these things up, put a little disc about the size of a do half dollar in there, and then they would send the finished disc, the sealed disc, you know, with a sealed roll and the disc in it. That went to Sheely's plant. And Sheely's people put the explosives in it, the stuff that would make this thing go off. Acid in one end and I'm not a chemist, so I can't tell you what, but some kind of potassium is at the other end that would ignite and produce an enormously hot flame. And they would cap it with, with, with um, wax. The problem with these things is that once you put them together, they're ready to go off. And the problem is, you don't know when they're gonna go off. Okay? Yeah, so it's, it depends on how, how quickly the acid got through the little copper plate in the center. Because once it got through three, it's bye bye baby. You know, all going on. So they, so anyway, the way it worked in New York is um, they worked out of, a, of uh, American Hamburg lines. And, uh, and these, they, they did it like everybody else. They hired stevedores, paid them a certain amount of money, told them to take these things into the ships that you're working on, particularly those that carry munitions, uh, of grains, uh, and uh, cotton, and put them where they'll do the most, where they'll start the biggest, hottest fire, and hopefully either blow the ship up or make it burn so much that, you know, it'll sink, what'll ever happen to it. And they did, and in all, they got about 50 ships that way. In Baltimore, 
he, he did he gave um, <laughs> Paul Hilkin the same pitch and Hilkin organized a, um, a, a work crew and he had a, his his straw man his right-hand man was a guy named Friedrich Hinch Hinch had been a captain an NDL captain whose ship the Neckar was interned in Baltimore he was also a naval reserve German naval reserve officer like all of those guys were so anyway he said sure he'd be happy to take part in this program and the way it worked is that uh, Rentlin had left Hilkin about a half a million dollars to work with and it was cash in the bank and Hilkin was to take that money and he, he was to pay people to do the things he needed done so they hired stevedores off the run who actually all ended up being African Americans and they hired all these guys off of the front there were three of them uh, Eddie I can't remember his last name, Eddie was the straw boss and Eddie had two fellows that worked for him and the way it worked Hilkin gave Aunt Freddie the money, he said okay here, here are all of these things I want you to hand out and get distributed appropriately when you're done with that here's the money to pay these guys with you, you, you get paid out of it and then you and then those guys so Freddie got to decide how much these guys were going to make you see it wasn't so it was, I don't know if you've ever seen the Three Stooges routine where they, he's, di he's dividing them dollars, one dollar for you, two, one dollar for me, two for you, one, two for me, three for you, one, two, three for me. That's the way Freddie did it. Okay. So Freddie, Freddie did this throughout the war. I'll tell you right now before we get, before we go any farther. The Baltimore sabotage cell was the most effective, the most efficient, the most active uh, German operated sabotage cell in America and it was never caught. Never uncovered, they never got a smell of it. And it wasn't until 1928 that all of this stuff came out. Anywho, so he's handing out all this, this money to these guys. They're happy as clams at high water because they don't have jobs. But, you know, go ahead. How did it come out, just out of curiosity? <laughs> I love it. In 1928, the United States, through the Mixed Claims Commission, was suing, physically, uh, literally, suing Germany for the damage done to Black Tom which the Baltimore is all dead, and the um, uh, plant in New Jersey, the um, uh, Kingsland Munitions um, Assembly Plant in Kingsland, New Jersey, which they did, right? And they, and they kept losing. They, the Americans kept losing their case in the, at all the hearings because the Germans simply denied it. We didn't do it. You know, prove it. You know? and, and so well then, Pure serendipity. I love these things. I see this why I like questions. The guy, Peasley, was the lawyer who was handling the case for Lehigh Valley Railroad. And he knew, I don't know if he knew Rodney, Rodney uh, King. And he got hold of him and Rodney said, sure. Did you guys know that the Germans, uh, the British had broken all the German codes in the first six weeks of World War I? Did you know that? It's the, it's the same as the enigma. I mean, in terms of scope and, and, and application and result, it's the same as the enigma revelations in World War II. They had all, by the sixth week of the war, the, the British were reading all German naval mail as it came out. That's how they got the Zimmerman telegram deciphered, you know, before the guy in Mexico really knew about it. Anyway. Anyway, King had in his files there, when the war ended for some reason, he got to keep them all. He doesn't have any more. He got to keep them all, he said, and Peasley got hold of him. He said, you ever heard of this guy or you don't know anything about it? He said, oh yeah. Um, the main, yeah, I've got all the stuff right here. You'd, I'm going hunting, but you can have my house for a week and read, copy, whatever you want, take it. So the guy goes through all these intercepts, these, these, these uh, radio intercepts that were between section politique and, and and the um, dummy corporation that the Navy had and their people back to Baltimore. And of course, what he's interested in is the sabotage side. And he reads it and he starts reading about Paul G. L. Hilkin. Whoa! So he goes out to Hilkin's house in Baltimore where he lived in um, Roland Heights. And he goes, I'm the <laughs> door open. Hi, I'm Paul Peasley. I'm a lawyer. Uh oh, I'm in trouble. And he said, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about this Baltimore sabotage cell you were running. And he said, I don't want to talk about that. He said, obviously that would cause me a lot of grief since I, it would make me a traitor. He said, there's no doubt that you're a traitor. I mean, that's not a question. 
I tell you what I'll do, I will get you, I will get you immunity to prosecution, but I need you to testify what you did. And he says, can you guarantee that there'll be no prosecution? Absolutely. Come in and be my friend. And so he turned it all, he had it all. Had it all. It was, anyway, when, when he went, then when he, when he began, when Hilkin began to testify, and everything he said is in that transcript, which is, I can tell you, I've seen it, I have it. It is huge of these hearings, these the, uh, mixed claims commission hearings. And he just laid it all out, date and time, people who worked for him, where they did it, who was doing what. For a guy like I, you know, who wanted to write about this thing, that was the mother load. I couldn't, I'd already written a book about the U Deutschland, the submarine we're gonna talk about here in a little bit. I'd already written a book about that 20 years earlier. I never knew this guy existed, other than the fact that, that he was you know, part of the company, you know. So I read it and I go, where have I been? This is another book. And I did. I did. Then, anyway, so that, does that answer your question? That's how he found out. You know how I get, I tell you what, I got on a Paul Hilkin before I ever got into this other stuff. Did you know the FBI records are on file on the, on, online? Yeah. It was known as the B of I before it became the Federal Bureau of Investigation. It was called the B of I. And it's a lot like, I know I'm knocked the poor guys, but there's a lot like the uh, Keystone Cops. And, and he, uh, so I was looking for something else. I was interested in something entirely different. And I, I was put in the name Paul Hill. I don't know why I did it there, but I did it. I put in the name Paul Hilkin, and boom, 1,200 pages all about Paul Hilkin. So I bought the whole file and sat down with it for a long time. And then that's when I, and then when I heard about this, I said, oh man, this is too good to be true. And I died gone to heaven. I didn't even have to leave my house. You know, it was all right there. It was given, handed to me. Anyway, so that's how it all came about. But, so Hilton was out there and around and people knew about him. They just couldn't put two and two together. And if I have time, I'll tell you why they didn't do that either. Well, we can stop and go to that right now. Anyway, so they had these three sabotage cells working and Baltimore is obviously very active and they're out there doing their thing. Oh, they were also spreading anthrax from New York to Savannah. They spread, they spread anthrax and glanders up and down the coast from March of 1915 no, it was actually April and May when they first started. April and May 1915 until we declared war in, in April 1917. And, and they were very effective with that stuff. It, it killed so many remounts and drayo animals that the British really got concerned. I mean, they, 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 they would ask their American uh, uh, counterparts, saying, look guys, I mean, obviously something's going on here. You, know, you got any vets in your country that look after these animals or anything? Because they're dying before they get here and those who get here are sick. And, uh, you know, we got to do something about this. And so they were, but they, we didn't know. We didn't. You know why? Because espionage was not a crime in this country. The feds didn't investigate it. It was investigated at the state and local level. And they never got down that far. I mean, nobody went to the state police and said, hey, uh, the British are complaining like, you know, kids with a, with a you know, sore toe that, that uh, their, their, their horses aren't getting through to them healthy. You know anything about that? No. I'm just a vet. You know, they got to come to me. I don't see anything there. Yeah. So it, didn't get, it just never got out. It was just the system the way it was. It just never got out. But they did the anthrax. They burned down silos like they were going out of style. Uh, they did train cars. Uh, they, they did strikes. They did a lot of stuff. Never got, nobody ever got on it. However, in New York, <laughs> in New York where they were doing the same thing, and they were, they were more active doing ships than they were anything else, they went into work, they went to work, in March, in March 1915, and they all got arrested in April 1915. The entire group in New York, New York, New York bomb squad got them. Well, <laughs> the headline news was, you know, there's a bunch of, bunch of German saboteurs, which they were, have been caught by the New York police. Paul Hilkin, didn't face him a bit. He figured, there's no way they're going to come to me because nobody knows me. And he was right. The guys in New Orleans go, ooh, ooh bad news. They're under them. They'll get, they just shut down. So <laughs> New York PD was responsible for getting rid of the New York sabotage cell and, and the New, New Orleans cell at the same time because they just shut down. They all went home. Hell, I'm not doing this. You know, don't want to do this. They, didn't. they left Paul Hilkin. Paul Hilkin became the paymaster for all sabotage operations, German sabotage operations on the East Coast. 
he also funded all the operations in Argentina, which was exclusive of the anthrax and glanders. He, he funded all the operations in Mexico, which were two for one to attack the uh, oil fields at Tampico, and the other was to organize some kind of um, gunboat operation on the Pacific coast to attack shipping. Uh, uh, it would be coming uh, out at that time. I think it was they were using the Suez Canal by uh, uh, Panama Canal by then. So he funded that, and he funded the um, the uh, espionage operation in Japan. All all out of money that was given to him by the Germans, and it was in these in these um, New York banks and in his bank, and he. He was never held accountable for any of that money. I mean, it's not accounted for. The only thing we, that I know that he had was what he testified to to the Mixed Claims Commission about his own operations. But, but he never did say what happened to the rest of the money that um, was left. Yeah. How, did, how did he recruit? He didn't have to. Rec I think that's a good question too. He really didn't have to. He he was he knew. He knew who he was. Okay. He was a successful, well-known businessman in Baltimore. Frederick Hinch, who was an NDL captain, was in a way his subordinate just to begin with simply because Hilkin represented NDL administration in Baltimore. And he actually had access to all the manpower he wanted off of those ships. He could, and he did for the submarine side of the thing. He drew crews off of those ships for all kinds of work in his uh, dummy company, the Eastern Forwarding Company. But as far as sabotage was concerned, he just he, he just went right down to the waterfront and got old Eddie, uh, Freddie, and um, and brought him back and um, told him what he wanted to do and said, "Here's uh, plenty of money for you." And more where that came from, and they were off and running. His crew was really small. He, uh, he got two other people. One, the other guy that was assigned to him. I'll tell you, I'm going to I'm going to digress here a little bit. There were three other people assigned to him later as things went on. Okay. One of them was, was a Dr. Anton Dilger, an American citizen, trained at Johns Hopkins University as a surgeon, who had joined the German army as an officer surgeon when, the war, when war was declared, had been in Germany for some time then, served with them. Somehow, and I've never worked out how, he got interested in anthrax and glanders. Section Politik grabbed him and, and said, listen, You've got all the credentials we need. You're an American citizen. You have a passport. You can legitimately go home through the blockade. No one will touch you. Will you do me a big favor? We've got this suitcase here. Now, don't open it because it's really deadly. And um, we want you to take this and set up a lab somewhere where you're going to go. And the guy says, well, I live in Chevy Chase. Well, that's a good place. Set up a lab in Chevy Chase. Manufacture this stuff. And then... Here's the name of a guy to contact, Paul Hilkin. You go down to Baltimore, which isn't very far away. You go down to Baltimore and you talk to Paul Hilkin, and he'll help you out. He'll get you how you can get this stuff spread around. Okay. So he came home through the blockade, reported to Paul, Paul Hilkin, and says, Oh, I'm really glad to see you. you know, how much money do you need? And the guy says, Well, I need $10,000 to buy a house and build a lab, and, and um, right now that's about it. Well, here you are. You know, 10 grand, fresh money. Go, go at it. So he did. So they built this lab up in Chevy Chase, and they, that's where they manufactured the anthrax. The other guy he got was a guy named, a guy named Fr uh, Fred Hermann, who was an American citizen, a 22-year-old kid, uh, had been visiting his mother, grandmother in Germany when the war started. No big problem for him. He was an American citizen, had a passport. He just had to come home. Well, he got contacted right away by a member of the German naval intelligence Ask him if he'd like to have a really adventurous life. And he said, sure. I mean, what the heck? And we paid really well. And they did. He said, we want you to go to England, and notably Scotland. We want you to hang around where they park all those big ships and let us know from time to time what they're doing, who's there, who's not there, who's coming, who's going. You know that kind of thing. Yeah, piece of cake, I'll do it. So he went up there and posed as a student, I think, at Glasgow University. And he was doing really well until British intelligence got onto him, and he had to leave the country. But he didn't go back to Germany. He went home. Because, see, they'd given him a lot of money, too. So he went home with the money and uh, got home and ran out of money and got bored. So he thought, well, I'll go back and try it again because that's what was an easy way to make money, you know. So he went back through the blockade. Not a problem. I'm an American citizen. I'm going to Glasgow. And uh, I'm, I'm going to go somewhere. Right through the blockade. Got back to Germany. 
And as he passed through Sweden, the naval attaché in Sweden uh, got a hold of him and said, uh, uh, would you like to go to work for a different intelligence agency? He said, sure. What do they pay? He says, well, they pay a lot more than the Navy does. He says, uh, here's the name, here's the address. It's Molkestrasse 8 in Berlin. He said, you go there and that's, that's called Section Politik. You talk to those people, they'll tell you what they want you to do. So he went to them, he had no problem, went out there. They in, indoctrinated him, told him what he was going to do, how he was going to work, told him how to read and write secret code and gave him a suitcase full of explosives and a little anthrax too. And uh, he brought it back to Baltimore. Uh, he gave it to Paul Hilkin and said, I'm also here to work for you. And he said, fine, I'll give you, you put you with Hinch, you guys make a list of the fa factories that we want to destroy, and then you divide the list between you and then take it from there. Fine. That's how so. The third guy you got, he got the third guy late in the program. In October 1960, a German army lieutenant, a guy named uh, Wilhelm Wurst, okay, Wurst. Wurst in German is sausage. And so he's, he's Willie Sausage. Okay. <laughs> Mother didn't like him. Anyway, he's Wilhelm Hurst. Hurst. And um, he comes over here with his, the, the required secret bag of anthrax and glanders and new explosive devices that are made of glass and fit inside a number two pencil. Much more efficient, much easier to hide, you know, again, pass through security and all kinds of things. And, he's, and, and his job, He's supposed to be Hilkins' assistant. But Verst doesn't want to do that. See, he's, he, he only has $50,000 in cash in his black suitcase. But he has a million dollars in, in credits at a bank in New York. He also has a third cousin whose name was Anna something, who was a dancer and a real <laughs> knockout. And so he thought it'd be, he'd go up there and he would just live in New York with his third cousin, kind of see the lights and have a good time. Because this thing was all going to blow over after a while and then he'd go home. So he told Hilkin, I've got an, another assignment in New York. And Hilkin never questioned him about it. So then he stopped at his mother, his, at his sister's house. His sister lived down in Baltimore. And he shows up at his sister's house with his suitcase and his black bag. And he, and, he, and he sits down with her and he tells her, he said, hey, well, I'm a German spy. I've been trained in espionage. I can write code. I can read code. I even have a hollow heel where I keep secret messages and things. And look, I've got $50,000 in my briefcase. And I've got a lot of stuff in there that's really bad stuff. It goes boom and other stuff. It's really ugly stuff. But I, that's, what, that's what I do. And she was really impressed. I mean, really impressed. And, he's, and he, told, he said, I got to leave. And he left that night. And he got on a train to go. And the next morning at coffee, because his sister always had coffee with her landlady in the morning. And she tells the landlady about her really exciting and interesting brother that just came and gone. He was a spy. He had a hollow heel in his shoe. And he had a bag full of money and a box full of explosives and lots of secret things he had to do. And the, woman, the other woman just stirred her car. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when she her husband phone, she said, uh, Frank, you know what that woman, our, our tenant, told me? She said that her brother, blah, 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 blah. Turns out that Frank was the United States attorney for Baltimore. <laughs> yeah. First should have been the spy who couldn't keep a secret. All right? Anyway, the, the FBI didn't exist. It was the B of I, and they didn't do spies and saboteurs. They were told about him, the, the Baltimore office run by a man named Billups Harris. Billups Harris, I love that name. <laughs> he heard all about him and they, and they all agreed, you know what, this is amazing. We have a real, live, honest to gosh, card carrying, living, warm German spy in our, right here in our town. Yep, we sure do. <laughs> well, you think you ought to go out and look him up? No, I think I'll report it to Washington first to see what they want to do. Well, by the time he reported to Washington, worse was long gone. He was up in New York doing his other thing. Anywho, when, the, uh, when we declared, when we broke diplomatic relations with Germany, Verst decided it was time for him to go home. The, the, the things were not going to turn out well for him. 
So he, he got, I don't know how he did it, but anyway, he got himself hooked up with the German diplomatic group that was leaving, and he went out with them. And so when he got back to Berlin, um, oh, before he left, by the way, he did stop at the bank and take out all $1 million, all right? Plus, while he'd been there, he'd been scamming money off of Hilkin at about $1,000 a week. His $50,000, I don't think he ever touched it, but he still had it. So he went home with quite a bit of cash, a lot more money than a 28-year-old guy ought to have, say, in 1917 in Germany. A lot of money then, a whole lot of money. Go ahead. All this emphasis on an anthrax, yeah. was that designed for, as you said, horses or for population? No, no, horses. They were, their whole function, they were, they were there to kill the remounts. That's, that was their job. Well, they were going to interrupt the supply line. I don't line. realize how much World War I ran on horse. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was a horse-drawn army. All of them were. We had trucks and things, but we used a lot of horses. Hey, we had cavalry still, and officers rode. Um, horses were really necessary in all the armies. They had cavalry yeah. uh, in 1936, a full division of yeah. Kansas. Yeah. Yeah. And they only had six tanks. Yeah, I had a, I had a, I was a tank, I was a tank commander in for eight years. I had a, an old, old first sergeant who then come out, had come out of the horse cavalry and into armor. He used to tell me, he said, I've driven every track the army has in the case it came in, and he was still wearing jodhpurs and spurs. <laughs> 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 anyway, yes, they were around. Yeah. Was that that? Easy to make way back. Oh yeah, it's real easy. It's been around for years. And 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 it was the cultures were made for them in Germany and they brought it and they expanded them here and then Dilger was a doctor and he well, he was a medical doctor, he still knew all about this, but trained in this stuff. He he it was a big lab. They manufactured that is, stuff. Is it yeah. as lethal to humans as I don't know, I don't know. I wouldn't I would I don't know. I know that it killed a lot of horses and mules, and that's what they were trying to do. I'll tell you how they, they, they had these syringes that were made for them. They were glass, big needle in them full of this stuff. It was a liquid form. And they would walk along the corral, wherever they, you know, they were, they were these holding pens were close to the waterfront. They, were, they even got on the farms on them. They'd just go down the pen sides, jab the animals in the shoulder or the thigh or the hip. And as they went by, kaboom, 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 and try to you know, inoculate as many as they could. Then of course, when then when, it, when one animal got it, then the other animals got it. They threw the stuff in their food when they could. It was pretty effective. I the, I tried to find out how many we really lost because I know it was really a problem for the British. But there was one estimate that said that, it, that out of all the remounts that were sent to England before we went to war, about half of them were killed, died in route or died. Use the word remount, but basically they were for. They were basically. Dray horses, dray animals, yeah. But they were always carried as, as remounts. That was how, you know, remounts, remounts. You know. So, is that, is that answer your question? Is that okay? Okay. The, um, where was I? What was I talking about? Oh, rain in California. We don't have any. It's a drought out there. Uh, <laughs> got any, we'll take it with me. Anyway, um, the, I've got to get back on track here for a second. Well, I was telling you about Verst, yeah. Tell you about Verst, yeah. He, gets back to Germany, and he goes out to Molkestrasse Ach, where he, or eight, where he was, you know, where they governed him, where they ran him, you know, and he goes, <coughs> and they let him in. And the, and the guy in general, what are you doing here? He says, well, I'm back, you know, they broke broken diplomatic relations, and, and then I came back. He says, I don't care if they broke diplomatic relations, you're supposed to be in the United States. That's where you're supposed to be working. Well, it seemed to me like we're not going to get to work there much longer. It was time for me to get out, and I'm back. And they fired him, <laughs> which really broke his heart. Anyway, he, when they fired him, he was now out of the army. So he went home with a million dollars and change, right? Which he used to live on until 1928. And to get this, and this is where the Hilkin thing comes together at the question in the back earlier. He got hold of Hilkin. I don't know how he did it, but probably by letter, because they could exchange letters, eh? and told him that, that um, he was out of money and he needed a little financial assistance, and uh, he was perfectly willing, now that, he, now that, now that Hilkin was a, a criminal, he was a traitor, that, that maybe first said, I might want to talk to some people in Washington about you. And that got, to, got worse to think, or you know, what's his name, Hilkin to think, and so that when Pel, Pel, uh, Peasley, 
contacted him. He was very happy to roll over. No, it all came together. But anyway, Burst, like all young guys with a lot of money and no brains, he spent it all. Had a good time doing it. Anyway, so now let's talk about this U-boat on the other side of the wall. Because we had this sab sabotage cell goes on. Sabotage in the United States ended uh, on the declaration of war here. And those guys all went to Mexico. All except Hilton. He stayed here. Okay. The idea was now to get a supply line built that would carry cargo from the United States back to Germany and from, the United, from Germany to the United States. The Americans needed aniline dyes because our dye industry, our fabric color, coloring industry over here, was in deep trouble. They, they, they depended entirely on German, German dyes. And they could try to make, they tried to make um, in synthetic replacements. And they, they did. They were okay, but they weren't, they weren't very good. So they really wanted those aniline dyes. And Krupp had over a thousand tons of nickel here, plus they wanted rubber and they wanted cotton and all. So the Deutschland was the first boat out of the, out of the barrel, and um, she came across the Atlantic. It actually took her 26 days. She went into Baltimore, and, and the crew was really well received because Baltimore was a big German, big German colony there. And the whole one of the purposes of this thing was pro was positive propaganda. And they, they got it. It was really quite an accomplishment. And, uh, I, it wouldn't, doesn't do much for us today, I guess. But I mean, they think, wow, a submarine all the way across. And the idea that this thing could come across and go back with its own fuel load uh, had another propaganda aspect to it was. It was sort of, a, sort of a veiled threat to the United States is that we can do it. You know, and the war can come to your doorstep. You know, because we can do it. And this boat demonstrated that. And, it did, and that, that veil threat did not go unnoticed. Anyway, so they're here in Baltimore. And, um, and they, they were wined and dined. Oh, well, they're, given, oh, they're given all kinds of neat gifts and things and made over and all. And they, there was this big deal about when they were going to go back to sea with this full load of, of, of stuff they had with them, copper and nickel, tungsten, no oil, rubber, lots of rubber, and, um, and cotton. And the boat was, the way the boat, the boat was only, only like 214 feet long, 30 feet wide, and uh, 37 feet from the rim of the conning tower, the bottom of the keel. And the pressure hull, you all know how they're built, I'll tell you anyway. The pressure hull's inside the boat like this, and then the casing is built around. Now, Pressure hole is just a cigar, it's just a little long flat tube, you know, long tube capped off at the ends. And then they've got a kind of a boat form built around, it looks like a real boat. Inside this casing, it was so much room deliberately made that they could store all the cargo inside there that uh, could stand immersion in salt water. And, and the tank deck on the boat if you went down through one of the hatches and you stood on the tank deck inside, now you're inside the casing, there's the pressure hole right next to you, the tank deck, these are the fuel tanks, water tank, ballast tanks, and they call tank deck. You stand on that, I could have stood underneath that thing, no problem, you know, in there. So the access to this as a, as a hold area was really pretty simple. They just had to be really careful what they stowed way aft because that's where the exhaust ports came out and all kinds of, they did get into trouble. One of them, they put some rubber back there and they all, and they, they got to stinking pretty bad and they had to move it. But for the most part, that was really, then they had two big holes inside where they put the dry cargo that couldn't stand immersion. And they had a forward section of the boat that was with the hold afterwards and these little passageways that went through and into the control room and then in the conning tower that went up in the back was another big hold and the engine room was clear at the back of all of that. The boat had been built on the cheap, okay. The, the, the diesel engines that it used for propulsion were not propulsion engines. They were generators. They were made to, uh, generators to create lights on, on, on larger ships and, and to run some machinery and things like that. They weren't they were 400 horsepower diesel, stationary diesel engines. They had to be modified to drive a submarine. They worked okay as long as they only had to drive a submarine that was in commercial work. Once they converted that boat and all the others like it to a war boat, 
those engines were really bad. They broke down, they failed all the time, a lot of problems with it. The boat itself, the design of the boat, because it was, it, it's, the aspect ratio between its length and its width was, was, it was, you know, was there's almost as much width in the sense as there was length. There was really a, a, a big aspect ratio. They would uh, only make, about, on a good day in smooth water, they would only make 10 knots on the surface. That's going flat out. That was as a cargo boat. As a war boat, nine, nine and a half knots was about the best they could do. That meant that as a war boat, on the surface, this submarine couldn't even chase a tramp freighter that was trying to get away from it. Because most, most tramps went 10 knots. So all he had to do was just fire, up the, fire it up all the way and, the, and they, he'd fall behind. The other problem they had is that when they would get into these extended chases, all boats without exception, one or both diesels would quit. And then they'd find themselves half adrift on a one engine speed or totally adrift on no engine speed. So the boats didn't work out as war boats. But as cargo boats, they worked out quite well. Um, they were slow divers, took them five minutes to get completely under on a good day. In heavy weather, they probably could not get clear under very fast. Uh, Kearney tried it up when he went around the Orkneys on his trip out. He tried to dive in very heavy weather. He, was, he thought he was about to run it. There was a, what he thought was a cruiser coming his way. And he wanted to get under and he had to finally force it. What he did is he, he, was, he was flooded forward in forward bow, bow planes were down. The bow wouldn't go down. It would just, it would bounce when the waves just keep going up. So finally he, his, his chief engineer, who was actually the diving officer and the man in charge, his chief engineer ordered the, ordered the boat to go back to diesel engines and go all ahead. What he was gonna do is drive her forward and hydrodynamically force the bow down. Then he was going to shut down the diesels and flood the stern tanks, kick in the electric motors, and, and get her down. Well, what happened is that he, he got the bow to go down, but the problem is the bow went down, boom, 45 degrees. And, and you know, that's a lot. And uh, people in the insides, you know, started doing the tumble routine, and the stuff started coming off and falling down. And, uh, it got, and the big problem was, the, the, the props were by that point, because the bow was down, you know, it's like a teeter time. You, know, you do this, it's right here in the center, it rotates. Props are up in the air. The only thing that's taking that boat down now is just the weight in her bow and whatever momentum she has. And at 110 feet, boom, she hit bottom. And she, <laughs> <laughs> lucky for them, because they hadn't hit bottom, they'd never come back. It, was, it just happened to be this little base of there, a little shelf. And, you know, in several hundred fathoms of water all around it, and they hit that one. And they, and, but they hit it so hard, and, the, and it wasn't rocky, that they buried the bow in the mud and stuff that was down there. So now they're sticking out of the water like an arrow with its feathers flashing around up in the sky. <laughs> and as the waves break over the stern, and it would go up and down like this, and then the propellers would throw spray in the air, he was afraid he was right, too. He said, you know, if there's really a, a, a cruiser or a destroyer up there, the spray he's throwing up, even though it's nighttime, is going to be visible forever. You know, we got to get that stern underwater. So Cle that was Cleese's job. So, <laughs> so he said he shut down, he shut the motors down. That was first smart move number one. And then he started trying to flood aft. Well, he couldn't flood aft because he's sticking up out of the water. Right? You know, get the, could, the Kingston valves were out of the water too. Boat wouldn't come down. So he said, okay, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to physically shift ballast aft. Now, and that looks great in these old war movies where the U-boats ran their guys forward. You know, they really did that. You know, they crashed either. Everybody run forward. It's not working. They, blum, they make human ballast in the bow. After. Or everybody run after. Everybody run here. Everybody go here. Now, those crews were 36 people, maybe 50 people sometimes. The Deutsche only had 28 people aboard. Three of them were officers, 25 guys. 25 guys, a third of them on, on, uh, on station all the time. I don't know, and the, man, what do they got left over? What, nine or 10 guys to run for? Not enough. But they had, they had these poor guys running aft. So then they tried to carry extra weight aft. And finally, finally, they were able to get the bow, they get the stern down just enough that they would get some water up and they were able to get the propellers underwater. Now Cleese decides, we'll start 
will go astern, it will, it will keep working back and forth. Now, well, the problem was that they were still so near the surface, the boat was doing this. See, she was going this way. And what that does, can you imagine the stress that put on the bow that was buried in the mud? I mean, these guys were sweating bricks, you know, worried about what if, what, what if we open the bow up? We're in deep, deep, we're already in deep trouble, my buddy. Anyway, so they keep working on it, and, they, and, he, and, and he worked on it, and after six and a half hours, he finally got that boat free. And get this, no leaks, no leaks. So then they very brought her back up again, and looked all around, and nothing was there, and then she, they took off again. That was the big, that, I'll tell you why that happened. The crew was well trained. Those guys were all out of war, war U-boats. They all had lots of experience. The three officers aboard were merchants, merchant officers. They got a three week submarine commander's training program. Yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah, that's what I thought too. And their job was to command this boat. That's why Heinrich Kleese, who was the chief engineer, was really the most important guy on the boat. He's the only one that really knew how to run one. You know, really knew what he was talking about. And, and they relied on the guy heavily for it. But, uh, but that was part of the problem. When the Bremen went to sea in September, under the same circumstances, same kind of boat, everything the same. When she went to sea, she just disappeared. And I think she's probably up there in the Orkneys about where, where uh, uh, Kearney was, but I think she didn't hit the shallow plot. I think she took the deep dive and went all the way. That's what I think. So, anyway, they ran this U boat line, or the submarine car uh, cargo line, uh, for two trips with one boat. In the meantime, the German Navy had decided that clearly this war was not going to end the way we want it to. All this other stuff we've been doing to get through the blockade isn't working. The only solution for us is unrestricted submarine warfare. And to do that, we're going to need every war boat we can lay our hands on. And that means that all these are now seven of these things left. These seven remaining cargo boats who have this enormous range are going to be converted to, to big gun cruisers. War, they call them U cruiser, undersea cruisers. Because it could be converted to big cruisers, and we're going to send them out far out into the Atlantic, clear over to the North American coast, and we'll, we'll interdict their traffic as much as we can uh, uh, at long range with these guys. And they were designed, they were not designed, they were actually equipped and, and set up at that time to stay at, stay at sea for 100 days. And so in 100 days, they thought they could do a lot of damage. And that was the concept. They lost two of those boats uh, during the war. The others were all uh, surrendered after the war, along with the Deutschland. The Deutschland, after the war, uh, was turned over to the British. Uh, they, they looked over, like everybody else looked over what they got out of the war, and they decided that there's really nothing interesting here for us. It's just, a, it's just scrap. And a guy named Horatio Bottomley, who was a politician and a crook, that's not self constantly is it? No, that's not an oxymoron. No, no, it's not. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, see, that is a politician and crook. That's how. Anyway, he's a politician and a crook. Uh, he bought the uh, boat. He bought the boat from the British for uh, about three hundred pounds. I don't know what that was. About seven, eight hundred dollars, something like that. And he was going to turn it into a showboat. He was going to drag it around the coast of the British Islands and show it off, and people would pay. 10 pence to go aboard and look around though. But before he did that, he, they were, the, the contract said, Navy contract said, you have to disarm this thing, okay, at your expense. Okay, no problem. So he took the guns off it and he took the torpedo tubes out of it and he took all the other stuff out of it. And, uh, but he overlooked an oxygen helium tank, a helium tank that had been left in the boat. So they towed this thing all around England from 1918 to 1920 and it, and it was predictably in, in real time with, with, on, a, on a real ledger, it was a flop, financial failure. In Bottoms ledger, on Bottoms ledger, it was not only a flop, it was a huge loss of money. Okay, so he used it as a tax break or whatever else they did with it. Anyway, this thing lay in sort of in a receiving status until 1922, when the Navy uh, ordered it just totally destroyed, and they sent it to a shipbreakers to be broken up, and she was. She was, laying in, she was in the yard at the shipbreakers and the, they were using um, apprentices who were all teenagers. They were 16, 17 years old, there were seven of them. And they were working on a Saturday. And they were working in the engine room, cutting the stuff out of the engine room. And they had this uh, helium bottle 
that was in there. And up to that time, they, all the other gas bottles that they'd found, they just opened the valves on them and didn't smell anything. They just, it was safe. They left it there. So the engine room is where the, where the apprentices, when they weren't, weren't really doing their apprentice thing, or maybe it was, uh, they were playing cards, having a beer, and um, just generally kicking back and taking life easy. And they did this by candlelight because it was dark in there and there was no, no electricity. And somebody somewhere along the line opened the valve on this helium cam, on this helium cam. And it blew up. I mean, it blew the boat up. And it was a humongous, it killed all the kids. And um, a terrible thing. And, uh, but it turned the boat to scrap real fast. And it was the <laughs> fastest, <laughs> fastest wrecking job that company ever did. The scrap and all the metal and the oddball metals out of stuff was turned into souvenirs, which today are huge collector's items. I have a collection of this stuff. Prices going up on like crazy. You can't even find it. When you can find it, they went. Look, an iron cross, I'll tell you what. Baltimore made an iron cross out of, out of ballast scrap. About just two inches square. I can tell you exactly, two inches square. Weighs about a pound. It was a paperweight. I bought one, oh golly, 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 a long time ago for $35. They're for 450 bucks a piece now you know, on eBay. Yeah. Oh yeah. man, oh man. I tell, I'm in the wrong business at the wrong time. Anyway. So, in the end, in the end, these two parallel operations by two separate German intelligence agencies failed to do what they were supposed to do. In the end, it, it, the war came anyway. They were, they were disbanded. The section politique was smart enough to burn every record they had in 1918. Um, and, of course, the German Navy records were kept. And luckily, I found uh, uh, a guy, uh, Fritz uh, Lohmann, who was the great grandson of Alfred Lohmann, who was the front man for the dummy company in Germany. That, and Alfred, before he died, had, had all the records, and he gave them to his nephew, Fritz. And so Fritz gave them to me. So I got all the DOR business records for the time that was doing this dummy business thing. Really interesting, really. They ran it like a real business. I mean, it was, they, but the money, the money came from the Deutsche Bank, actually the money came from the German National Treasury, Reichskammer, to the, uh, to the Deutsche Bank, where it was essentially laundered. Then it was taken over to DOR, where it was again laundered and paid back to the various government accounts that actually were building the boats and running the crews and paid the troops. So on paper, if you ever did, and that's what I have, it looks like it was a real, honest, private-owned civilian company. Because the money is coming out of Deutsche Bank, the money is going to DOR, which is a subsidiary of Norddeutsche Lloyd. The crewmen are all NDL employees. Here are their, here are their records and all that. And when the war is over, the money all, all goes back to Deutsche Bank. Bingo. But I also have the Navy records, and they have the other side of the coin, which is really interesting. Hey, guys, that's about it for me. What do you got for me? Anything? Hey, thank you. You got a question back there? What are you doing with research? What was the risk-reward considerations done by the, done by the German government? And was this whole thing run through the entire system? So that the diplomatic ramifications were considered? Or was this strictly a Navy operation, and they just Okay, you're talking about what, the, what was the view of, of, of the German government about America's involvement in the war? Well, no, I was thinking more of the impact of the, sab the, with the results of the sabotage program offset the effect, possible effect upon American public opinion. Okay, okay. And, then, and, how, and who in the German government actually did, the, did that consideration? Okay, basically. The civilian German government was opposed to anything that would bring the United States into the war. That was uh, von uh, uh, Bethmann Hulvey. Right. The military side of the government, who really ran the war, they didn't care what you did. They, their, their, their feeling was, let the United States come into the war. By the time they get over here, in time, we'll have won the war. It was hubris is what it was. They generally, but as early as, as as a winter of 1915-16, there, uh, there were a number of German officers, sir, I mean, general grade officers, who were 
pretty well convinced they were going to lose the war. When lose it, you know, no matter what they did, they just materially they couldn't carry out the war. It was a material war. That blockade was. There's a book, great book called Starvation Politics, and that was truly star people did starve. I mean, they later on they tried to play it down, but a lot of Germans died in the winter of 1718, and that, that blockade lasted into 1919. War was over, and they were still blockaded, and people did die. It was real hard on the old people, real hard on the little kids. But, uh, okay, but we're still staying with your question for a minute. There was always a concern that the Americans would come into the war. They were already at war with the British. They were already at war with the French. You know, nothing to do about that. But they were really afraid of the Americans coming into the war. On one hand, the big issue was the Americans had all the financial capital they needed to, to fight a war and all the materials they needed to feed a war. Plus, they had a lot of people. You know, and they could draw on a pretty good-sized army. The big thing the Germans were thinking about is that how are they going to get them? Well, that's a lot of people to bring across the ocean, you know. And, and they thought, oh, we'll just torpedo them. It'll be a turkey sheet. Well, it wasn't, and we did. And we ended up there with something over a million people, uh, fresh, young, well-equipped, healthy. So they, a lot of the British weren't by that time, and the French weren't. No record of mutiny. Um, and it did tip the scale. But when these two operations started, it was a conscious effort to not make them public in any way. It's hard to keep blowing up a factory out of the public. You know, it gets in the press and people read it. And it's all really p problematic. But they didn't want any connection to come back to the German government. And this is pure hubris. You have a good point there. You ask about the diplomatic corps. The diplomatic corps was part and parcel of both operations. On one, I, I, this, I'm gonna, this is an aside entirely, as an example of what we're talking about. The Etappendienst, one of their wartime jobs was to run prisoner of war escape routes. They ran a route out of Siberia through China, across the Pacific, across the United States, across the Atlantic, down through the Nordic States, and back to Germany. I, I have a book under consideration now, it's about Eric Killinger, the first German officer to use that route and the only one to get back to Germany by that route. The other routes that they ran were through Russia and back down because it was a, it was a uh, and along the way, the German consulates and embassies would provide these escapees with the um, necessary identification, money, food, safe houses, people they could contact, as long as they were able, because they couldn't in, foreign, in, a, in a hostile country, but in China they could, and in parts of Eastern Europe they could, you see. So yes, the dip diplomatic corps took part. Here in, in the United States, in my city, in San Francisco, the, the, the Ameri German consulate in San Francisco was the consulate that, that held the money and acted as the paymaster for the saboteurs that operated in, in our area, San Francisco, Oregon, uh, up, up, to, uh, up to Washington. So yes, the diplomats were definitely involved, and the, typically if, if, if they had a, somewhere a military attaché, as they did in Washington, he was the guy that ran that operation. If not, it was whoever diplomat in the office was assigned the collateral duty. You bet. They were all involved in it. And they did the same thing on the other side. When, they, when the U-boat, uh, when the Deutschland was here, the diplomats just scurried around and did everything they could. And their big policy, their big problem was, the British wanted that boat in turn. The British argument was, hey, whoa, 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 hold on. That's not a freighter. That's a U-boat. You know, a rose by a coal by any other name is a rose, right? Any other name in a U-boat is a U-boat. And it doesn't have guns. It may not have guns. It's still a U-boat. Don't argue. U-boats are war boats. Well, you can't use a U-boat for anything else. What are you going to do with it? Well, it's a cargo boat. Not a cargo boat. Doesn't care. 800 tons doesn't count. See? Well, the Americans were in a bit of a pinch. They didn't want to be, they were getting beat about the head and shoulders for being unneutral in, in fact. So they said, well, we better show some neutrality. And so they sanctioned the boat and it could stay. And then, and that's what the diplomatic, German diplomatic court did. And they worked really hard to see that that boat was recognized as a commercial freighter and had all rights and rights and privileges of a commercial freighter doing commercial business in this neutral port. Does that answer your question? I, I guess so. It's just how 
how the Germans put this put this in with their sort of broader outlook on how to win the war, how to limit the war. They weren't didn't want to limit the war. They wanted to limit the war in the sense they didn't want America to come and do it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah the, I'll tell you, I know you're all ready to go. I, I got had guys to go. But see, once they capture you, you can't get away. The, uh, I've maintained for years that Germany lost the war in the first six weeks. And that's when they didn't attack the British cross-channel traffic that was transporting the British expeditionary force to France. That would have been a turkey shoot down there. There was no anti-submarine capability at all. None. Except ramming, if they could do that. Or shooting the thing with a gun, if they could do that. But there was no, there was no anti I, I know that, that I know all about the English Channel. It's cha I know about its currents. I know about its shifting shoals. All of that's there. But I want to remind people: those U-boat skippers and their crews, they weren't there on a pleasure cruise. They were to go. They, they had the, and they did it because from 1915 on, U-boat after U-boat went down through the English Channel. And, you know, and, they had, and they had problems, but they got through. It could be done. And I maintain by not, not doing it in the first six weeks of the war, they let the British get a toehold in France, and, the, and they stayed there. But if they had sunk those ships and killed all those guys, the British Labor Party, who was a, opposed to the war anyway, they probably would have put a lot of pressure on the government to bring that war to an end. You know, or make get a negotiated peace early in the process, which is what the Germans really wanted. Yeah. They thought the Germans had fought three wars of unifications and won them all within six or seven weeks at a time, and that was how that was their model for war. They saw World War One when they got into it as about a six week, maybe maybe four months, maybe by Christmas, but at the, at the most, then the war will be over, and it'll be a negotiated peace. And when it didn't happen. They didn't have anything to fall back on. No. They had no reserves. There was nothing coming in. They were stuck. And it just, what, the same thing happened to them in World War II. Yeah. You guys? Yeah. In the beginning of World War I, uh, when we ended, I believe the Navy uh, confiscated 16 German ships. Oh, yeah, they did. Fatalant was one of them, and it, and it carried a lot of American troops to Europe. Okay. <laughs> uh, ships. Yeah. Now, were those diesel-powered ships, or were they steam? No, they were all steam. Those were coal-fired ships. Okay. Yeah, those were all coal-fired. Yeah. We didn't get you didn't start getting oil oil-fired. Well, the oil-fired uh, came in World War One because the uh, the four stackers were oil-fired. The, uh, the the new class of oil four stackers, but but the, but commercial ships were steam-fired for coal-fired, and then and then all oil-fired steam after that. But World War One that was a coal that was a coal war. Yeah. Uh, when I first went to sea, I had a chief engineer who had been on a German submarine. Oh, we, yeah. And he was on the submarine that sank the Lusitania. Oh, for heaven's sake, the U-10, yeah. So he, uh, oh, U-20, U-20, yeah. yeah. Uh, how he was yeah. on the submarine. That would be him. Yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to have talked to a guy like that. The kind yeah. of death traps. Yeah. <laughs> uh, understatement of the year. Hmm. Anything else from you guys? When you first mentioned the New York cell sending stuff down to Baltimore, you mentioned uh -huh. two things. The, the stuff that killed all the horses, but... Anthrax and the glanders. Animals. What was the second thing? Glanders. What? Glanders. What is that? Glanders is a, a, a similar... Attacks uh, uh, cattle, horses and cattle in the lungs. Attacks their lungs. Yeah. It's as deadly as anthrax and probably meaner. But, uh, so they used them both. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.